Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this virtual event. This is new for all of us. And the title of the event is The Coronavirus and the Bursting of the Everything Bubble. Now, we had planned this event some time ago. In fact, at the beginning of January, we were supposed to have it in the middle of March. But then when the epidemic came by, we had to postpone it. So we've now doing this uh, virtually. But it seems that this timing isn't so bad after all, because what has happened since the beginning of the year is we've had the most rapid 30% decline in global equity prices on record. We've had a substantial repricing of credit risk. Uh, this has, of course, been promoted by the deepest global economic recession in the post-war period. And what we've also had is we've had the boldest monetary and fiscal policy response uh, that we've seen in our lifetimes. So this raises just a whole host of questions uh, that we'd like to address in the next hour and a half. And how we're doing it is that we try to reduce it down to four basic uh, questions. Uh, the first of which is, how does the current financial market crisis differ from that in 2008, 2009? Mm -hmm. Once we've had one of the panelists answer that question, we'll move on to the next, which will be, how deep might the current US and global economic recessions be? And what are the prospects that we get a V-shaped economic recovery? We then go on to the third question, which is, how are we to manage the global debt problem, uh, which will certainly have been exacerbated by a very deep global economic recession. Uh, and finally, we'll come to the question, uh, what are the implications of the current crisis for the survival of the euro and for the emerging market economy? So we've got quite a menu of topics to cover. And I'm very grateful uh, that I've managed to assemble uh, a panel of real experts this afternoon to discuss these questions. Uh, and they are Tobias Adrian, who heads the IMF Monetary and Capital Department, uh, Capital Markets Department. What he also does is he is the principal author of the excellent Global Financial Stability Report. Uh, we then got Jeffrey Frankel, uh, who's a very distinguished teacher at uh, Harvard's Kennedy School. He's a member of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Couldn't get a better person to tell us about economic cycles. And then we have uh, Bill White, uh, who's earned an international reputation for his prescience and his great forecasting ability, not least the 2008 global economic crisis, uh, who comes to us from with a lot of experience at the Bank for International Settlements at the OECD. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'm grateful to have uh, as uh, our moderator, uh, my good friend and my event collaborator. In fact, uh, Alex Pollock and I, we uh, did an event, uh, I recall March 2008, just as the subprime uh, mm. bubble was bursting. Um, so we go back, uh, we have some 10 years in uh, these event trenches together. And Alex is now a senior official at the United States uh, Treasury. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Alex and uh, take it away, Alex. Thank you very much, Desmond. Uh, it's an honor to moderate such a distinguished panel and a pleasure to add my welcome to all our webinar participants. Uh, as Desmond said, we've organized our consideration of the global bursting of the everything bubble uh, into four component questions. Each of our panelists will address one of the four questions in about 10 minutes of opening remarks. Then each will be followed by 10 minutes of discussion among the panel. Uh, the panel members will speak in this order, uh, first Tobias, then Jeffrey, then Bill, and then Desmond uh, at the, at the uh, cleanup spot. Uh, all participants in this webinar are invited to send in questions by email or text. Uh, they go to Isaac Abraham, who will get them to me for possible use during the discussion periods. Now, please 
uh, begin your question with your name and your affiliation and send it to Isaac.Abraham, that's Y-I-S-E-H-A-K dot Abraham at A-E-I dot org or at uh, hashtag A-E-I financial crisis. I'm certain that, that today we're going to have an informed, insightful, and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, to keep us on time for our prompt 3.30 adjournment, uh, I remind my colleagues on the panel of this, which is our time reminder. Uh, and I need to add that I'm moderating today uh, purely in my personal capacity uh, and not uh, as representing the U.S. Treasury Department. Now, uh, let's come to question one. Uh, the full statement of this question is, the coronavirus appears to have burst many asset, price, and credit market bubbles around the world, where financial markets especially fragile. How does this world financial crisis compare with that of 2007-2009? And Tobias has this one, so Tobias, you have the, you have the floor. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, this is a, a terrible disease, and uh, I know uh, a number of people that have got the disease. Uh, it, is, it is not pleasant. Uh, millions are infected, uh, hundreds of thousands have died. I hope that you're all healthy and safe. Um, the pandemic, of course, has triggered a containment effort uh, that essentially led to a shutdown or a partial shutdown of economies around the world. And that has led to an economic crisis. So pandemic leads to an economic crisis and the economic crisis, of course, has triggered financial stability concerns. So let me step back for a moment and ask where were we in, say, January before uh, the current crisis uh, really went global. And so what we had in, in January where overstretched asset values. Um, so we are running asset valuation models uh, in equity, in credit, and in rates markets. And uh, you could see stretching uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, so we typically use, uh, you know, say for an equity uh, valuation model, we use earnings forecasts. Uh, we use uncertainty about earnings going forward, as well as interest rates, short-term and, and long-term interest rates. And there was definitely overstretching in many markets. Uh, so we warned that uh, an adjustment could happen. Secondly, underwriting standards were deteriorating. And uh, that was particularly true in the corporate sector. So unlike the 2008 crisis where underwriting standards were deteriorating very rapidly in the housing market, this time it does more focused on, uh, on the corporate market. And of course, leverage uh, had risen uh, you know, in sovereigns, uh, in corporates, um, and you know, in the household sector in some countries. Not in the US. So in the US, the household sector had delivered quite rapidly, but in many other uh, advanced economies, uh, household leverage had also gone up. And so, um, you know, the one bright spot were the banks, because of course, since 2008, massive regulatory reform efforts had made sure that there was more capital and more liquidity in the banks. And I think people felt pretty good about uh, the, the, the safety of the banking system. So now comes this massive economic shock. And as um, was already alluded to, I mean, just in terms of you know, what we expect for 2020 and 2021, this is the biggest economic contraction that we have seen in the post-war period uh, for some countries going back to the Great Depression. Um, so global growth is, we had anticipated uh, growth above plus 3% globally as of January. And now we are expecting a global contraction of 3% or more. And in many, in many countries, we see quarterly growth rates that are on the order of minus 20% or so. So massive, massive contractions. Of course, you all know that, you know, the number of unemployed in the US has gone up by more than 20 million, right? I mean, these are numbers we have not seen in 80, 90 years. And so, you know, what was shocking in February and March. So, you know, the pandemic 
really uh, started in China, you know, back in November, December. But then in January, right around January 20th, it accelerated. And there was a sell-off in China, not massive, but there was some sell-off in China as China moved into containment efforts. And then the virus moved on to Italy and some other European countries. And eventually it became clear that this was going to be a global phenomenon. So at that point, so Italy started to shut down its economy. And then it, it just started to spread everywhere. So markets realized, okay, this is going to be a massive economic crisis. And you saw a sell-off that was very fast, very sharp, very deep, right? So equity markets around the world generally sold off around 30%, you know, within less than a month. I mean, some of them, you know, 15, 20% in a week. So this is extremely fast, extremely steep. And of course, in, 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 with that kind of a shock, all of the amplifiers that we knew from back 2008 kicked back in. The leverage cycle where institutions are forced to deliver because their risk management systems tell them, well, now volatility is high, you have to deliver, then you have to sell your risky assets into a market that is feeding back into volatility. So there's an adverse feedback loop, margins were tightened in the CCPs, uh, and uh, there was, um, you know, uh, massive deleveraging due, due to margin calls. Uh, of course, there was some uh, uh, worry about run risk. We didn't see runs, but when I talked to market participants, they were acutely uh, uh, fearing that uh, some of the money market funds were going to see runs again. And... Um, and of course, there were massive redemptions among asset managers, right? And we had worried for many years that, you know, say a credit fund, a credit mutual fund has daily redemption on the liability side, but the assets can take many weeks or months to sell. So there's a liquidity mismatch that is potentially dangerous. Now, the good thing is we didn't see sort of like um, the plumbing really blow up, right? Uh, so markets were shut down uh, a, a number of times for technical reasons, but we didn't see distress in the CCP. We didn't see uh, distress of major institutions, but we did see massive market illiquidity. And the market illiquidity even hit the U.S. Treasury market uh, and the German Bund market, right? I mean, the U.S. Treasury market is the most liquid asset market in the world. It was massively illiquid. And so people have linked that to three reasons. So number one, uh, of course, in the on-the-run securities and treasuries, about 70% of volume is done by high-frequency trading firms. And you know, when, the, you know, when you have these massive uh, pricing moves, I mean, they don't take the other side of the trade, of course. Secondly, the usual institutions that are sort of like uh, the, the long-term investors that are stabilizing markets, also had massive mark-to-market -market losses in every asset class, right? Every asset class sold off. And then thirdly, um, of course, the dealers uh, had, uh, you know, less balance sheet capacity. So um, as a result of this, you know, very, very worrisome market illiquidity, market dislocations, the Fed and other central banks around the world came in in very large size very quickly. I mean, we have seen a rollout of emergency backstops to the market-based system within two, three weeks of magnitudes that are larger than what was rolled out in 2008 and covering more asset classes than, than were ever covered back in 2008, right? It's not just the money markets. Uh, the money markets, uh, you know, money market mutual funds were totally backstop. Commercial paper market was backstop. Uh, cross-currency swap markets were backstop because, of course, you know, institutions uh, that are hedging their dollar exposure in the FX swap market also had an acute funding shortage. So the, 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 the Fed started FX swap lines with uh, 14 central banks. Uh, but also, <laughs> uh, for the first time ever, the Fed intervened in corporate markets, buying corporate bonds in the primary market and in the secondary market, and even, you know, primarily in the investment grade segment, but also, uh, you know, investing in ETFs of high yield bonds, 
not in massive size, but to, to some degree. And, you know, central banks around the world, the Bank of England, the ECB, the Bank of Canada, you know, Bank of Japan, the major central banks all rolled out these massive, massive liquidity backstops. So just to give you a number, I mean, what the central banks have committed so far is about six trillion. And some of what they have committed is actually unlimited, right? The asset purchase program of the Fed at the moment is unlimited. Um, and this was done in conjunction with massive fiscal programs as well. To date, fiscal programs are about 8 trillion, 8 trillion total. Remember, total GDP globally is about 80 trillion. So that's 10% of GDP rolled out within uh, two months since you know, February, over two months, a 10% fiscal stimulus has been rolled out. These are very large, very aggressive policy responses. Despite well, I, that- I hate, I hate so, to say it, I hate to say it, but you have one minute to wrap up here. Yeah, no problem. So then there was a massive re relief rally, right? And so basically markets went down 30% and now they've come up 20%. So now we're back in, in a, in, a, in, a, in a territory where markets are stretched. And, um, you know, we might well see negative news uh, uh, realize. Uh, so I see three risks going forward. Number one, insolvency. You know, the fiscal programs are all there to make sure that insolvency is kept in check to some degree. But of course, you can't save every company, right? And so we will see large insolvencies of corporates, of countries, of households. And you know, once businesses go out of business, you can't just switch them on. So a crisis that you know many thought would be well, yes, we have to wrap might up. Be, Maybe you could just give us the other two yes, quickly. And the and two we'll other things are on. emerging markets, of course, and banks. And I'm happy to talk about banks a little bit later. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, uh, open it up for any other uh, comments on that uh, pretty pretty bleak set of comments, Tobias. Uh, but thank you for them anyway. Uh, <laughs> anybody else uh, want to uh, open up with uh, uh, remarks uh, on this topic? Can, no? can I just can no? I just do one no. thing, uh, Alex? Um, um, I mean, Tobias obviously is, is quite right in saying that uh, um, there's this chain it's of events. It go, it's different from 2007 and 8. It started in the financial sector. Then it had real effects. Then it fed back through NPLs into the financial system. And, and this one has started differently with the pandemic to the real to the financial. But ha having, having said that, there's, there's two other big differences, it seems to me. Um, between this crisis and the previous one. And one of them is that all of the existing preconditions, um, they're quite different in 2007 and eight from what they are today, that they're, they're even worse. The underlying things that Tobias made reference to right at the beginning, even worse today than they were in 2008. And the second thing is that in 2007 and eight, the emerging markets, particularly China, were part of the solution. And now this thing is spread out to the emerging markets in such a way that they're also part of the problem. So uh, the situation I think is even more difficult than it was in 2007 and 2008. Thank you. Uh, one more comment, then I'm, then I'm gonna go to an audience question. Desmond? Yeah, I, I very much agree with Bill that the starting position was a lot worse. You know, We had a lot more debt, we had a lot of credit mispricing, we had asset bubbles all over the show, and now we get this enormous shock that is simultaneously affecting a lot of countries, all countries, in a way that we haven't seen in 90 years. You know, I'd also agree with Tobias that the policy response has really been uh, so much bolder than anybody could have thought. You know, they've managed to keep it together uh, so far, but obviously the story, uh, I don't see the story as uh, nearly finished. Uh, that I'd just be curious uh, to have Tobias's take, you know, that he mentions the banks being in a very much better sure. position than they were in 2008, a lot of capitalized, you know, whether he'd say the same of 
the European banks, I'm thinking, you know, for instance, like the Italian banking sector is pretty messed up. And I would also just wonder whether the problem this time around is not going to be in the shadow banks, you know, that that's really the unregulated part, uh, you know, whether when we see all of the bankruptcies, we see the insolvencies, you know, that lie ahead, you know, whether we can't still get a lot of stress in the financial system, but coming not so much from the banks, but from the shadow banking sector. Bias? Yeah, so uh, let me start with the with a, with a market-based finance or shadow banking, right? I mean, the central banks felt compelled to entirely backstop the market-based system, right? And that tells you uh, what type of fragility you saw there. And the defaults haven't even started yet. So, you know, once we see the, the, the wave of defaults hit, I mean, you know, let's see what happens uh, in that sector. Because, of course, central banks are good in, at injecting liquidity, but they're terrible at you know solving solvency problems. Now, treasuries are there. Uh, you know, finance ministries, treasuries are there. They do lots of credit guarantees, but still, you know, insolvency is is very disruptive. Secondly, concerning the banks, I mean, you know, if you just look at tier one common equity, for example, you know, that was about four to five percent prior to the two thousand eight crisis, and now it's you know. 10, 12% uh, or so. So it's like two to three times higher than what it was. So definitely the banks are much safer. But having said that, this shock is huge. And, you know, we might sort of like our baseline of the IMF is, you know, has some sort of a partial rebound in 2021. But if you don't see the partial rebound, if our adverse scenarios realize, I mean, the stress test that we have run in some countries are not as severe as, as, as those kinds of scenarios. So we might see that the weak tail of banks is gonna be hit hard. And concerning say banks in Europe, of course they have low profitability, right? Uh, in the US banks are pretty profitable, in Canada they're pretty profitable, but in continental Europe and many other economies around the world, profitability is very low. So now you get hit with capital. When you look at yield curves, they are even more compressed, even lower, even longer. So generating net interest margin is gonna be extremely difficult for many years. So you get hit by capital, then you have to earn it back. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, toxic, it's a toxic mix for the bank sector. Thank you. One of our audience members has raised a, a sector which certainly has big problems, which no one has mentioned yet, which is pension funds. Uh, and they, uh, they write in, uh, Mitch McConnell said he favors allowing states struggling with high public employee pension costs and the burden of the pandemic to declare bankruptcy rather than giving them a federal bailout. Does anybody on the panel have a, have a, com have a comment on that state bankruptcy for, for the public pension fund? Pub pension funds are obviously to buy us a problem around the world, not just in this country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we have seen risky asset prices come back. I mean, there's a lot of volatility, so prices might go down, they might go up. You know, in a couple of months or years, eventually we will be through this and they will come back. But of course, that doesn't help people that need money now. Uh, I think this is one thing. And the second thing is that defaults are going to hit the pension funds uh, quite dramatically as well. Uh, and you know, how to deal with that is a, is a terribly complex problem. Uh, and, you know, as long as I can think, uh, it has been a worry on people's mind and nobody really addressed it ever. And it has gotten a lot worse in an environment where, you know, volatility is high, insolvency is high, unemployment is high, and interest rates are extremely low. I just add, even before the crisis, the number that I remember, maybe it's from one of your reports, Tobias, I can't recall, is that uh, the, uh, the average pension fund in the US was, uh, had 72% funding before the crisis hit. So we're already in, in the deep doo-doo. Thank you. Any other comments on this or anything? We have another a minute or so on question one. If not, we will proceed to question two, uh, which I'll remind us. Question two is, uh, how would you assess the U.S. and world economic outlook? What are the chances of a V-shaped world recovery? 
How adequate has the international economic policy response to the crisis been? And this one is for Jeffrey, so it's all yours. Thank you, Alex, and thanks to the other organizers uh, and Desmond too for uh, having having me on, having all of us on. Um, so uh, my theme is going to be those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, I'm, you've already heard a fair amount about the uh, global financial crisis of 2007 and eight, and I'll refer to that, and also a uh, history of the interwar period. Let me start by saying a bit about the bursting of the everything bubble, which is the title of this, uh, of this uh, 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 session. And we, we've heard about it from Tobias, and, and Bill White has uh, uh, warned us over the years of the, the cycle. The part of the cycle I want to mention is risk on versus risk off, where risk can be readily uh, proxied or measured by the, the VIX. Um, the, uh, the perceived uncertainty in the in the in the in the stock market. Um, the uh, I am struck. Uh, I was struck in 2007 and struck again this time by uh, not just the fact that asset prices were high, stock market stock market was high both times. Uh, housing prices were high, uh, debt uh, corporate debt uh, this time, but how um, low the VIX was. The VIX was at record lows uh, around the 10 just before the 2007 2008 crisis even though it was perfectly possible to list uh, supposed black swans tail events uh, of which uh, a, a downturn in the housing market was already underway uh, we already knew about the risk of pandemics uh, if we could have a, could have had an inflation shock we could, all, all, we could write down a list of shocks and yet the markets acted as if there was no uncertainty in the world. I think because they were backward looking when they uh, do the options pricing formula, they, they, they plug in whatever the, the variance has been uh, over the last uh, uh, few years or 10 or 20 years, or uh, one way of saying it is uh, there had never been, uh, people said, the, uh, housing prices never go down in nominal terms. Well, it wasn't true. Nom housing prices had gone down in nominal terms in the 30s. Housing prices had gone down in nominal terms relatively recently in Japan. But because it hadn't been in the United States in the last 10 or 20 years, the mortgage-backed securities were priced uh, without the, I think, without the possibility that they would uh, go go, uh, go go down. And 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 from the, the VIX from from the, its low of 10 uh, at the time of Lehman went up to uh, 79, I believe, to give you a sense of the of of the scale. Well. Um, I, and, and this phrase black swans has come to be used to refer to tail events that supposedly we couldn't possibly foresee. But these actually are events that we could foresee as something that is likely to happen eventually, but we just can't forecast with confidence will happen in the near, in the near future. Well, I think the coronavirus recession of, of 2020 has some things in common with uh, the global financial crisis, even though there's some, uh, it was some much more sudden and so much deeper and different in so many ways. Um, as with other so-called black swans, the risk of a pandemic was known, uh, that it would happen eventually was predictable, was widely predicted. Um, it was known that the government was not adequately uh, pr preparing. Um, I think we do a poor job with situations where the experts all agree that with maybe 5% probability is a chance of disaster in this coming year. The disaster is bad enough that the uh, we should be making uh, preparations, but the political system and the social system doesn't deal well with with risks that are only five percent in any uh, uh, given year. And even after the coronavirus hit uh, China in late last year and uh, Hubei province in, in, in particular, and even after it started to spread in the early part of this year, um, uh, our leaders. Uh, did not take it uh, seriously enough. And it wasn't just the politicians, it wasn't just the governments that didn't take it seriously enough. Um, but the, the financial markets, as late as mid-February, the markets essentially perceived no risk. Now, I mean, the stock market was at all times high, but why weren't they even saying there isn't, there's, there's, there's a chance that it will go, go, go down? Uh, the VIX remained uh, below 19 until February 24th. And but, you know, by then it had become clear that this was a serious risk to the global economy. All right, um, so I've been asked uh, about the uh, chances of a V-shaped uh, uh, world recovery, and I would say uh, not very good. I'll talk about the V-shape and then the U-shape and then the W-shape, but uh, that's the rest of my comments. Um, you know, at first there was a reasonable case to be made for a V-shape, particularly within an individual country like China. It's the 
pattern that has been followed in natural disasters. For that matter, it was a pattern that was followed in the Chinese economy when they were hit by uh, the uh, uh, the virus and the SARS virus in 2003. Namely, you have a big hit to GDP in one quarter or maybe two quarters, but then you bounce back in the next quarter. And when you look at the GDP numbers for the year as a whole, it hardly shows up. That's the pattern with natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes most of the time. And there was reason to think that that would also be true here. But but uh, that, that I'm talking about a few months ago. It's clear by now that that's way too optimistic. Uh, the, the, the most we could hope for uh, for the world economy is a U-shaped recovery um, where, it, uh, where we're at the bottom for uh, for a while, and maybe uh, certain segments of the economy can uh, go back go back to work, perhaps in shifts, while others remain shut down for longer. I would think stadiums and theaters and bars should be uh, examples of candidates that, and, and tattoo parlors. So thinking of uh, Georgia and bowling alleys, I don't see those as essential uh, high priorities. Uh, maybe that's just because that, uh, that reflects my own uh, activities, but uh, they. they uh, um, I don't see them as a top priority to, re to reopen. I think we're not going to be able to really reopen until we achieve massive, frequent, convenient, free testing for the virus, uh, contact tracing, uh, reliable tests for antibodies. Uh, we don't have these things. We don't have these yet, contrary to what some uh, of our politicians claim. We're nowhere near testing enough, and we need to uh, be testing a lot more widely before we can really uh, go back to work. And of course, eventually we're hoping for a vaccine uh, or a treatment, mm -hmm. but we're told that that would be a one and a half years away or, or more. Um, so uh, uh, U-shaped recovery at, the, at, at best, it would still be U-shaped, I suppose, if we recovered a year from now. It's a lot better than you know the Great Depression of the 30s. What I worry about is a W-shaped recovery arising out of policy mistakes by our political uh, leaders. So let me spend the rest of my time on, on that. Two likely kinds of policy mistakes, and both of them uh, would represent uh, repeating the mistakes of, of history from the interwar period. Both of them were well demonstrated by events uh, uh, between World War I and World War II. Mistake number one is sounding the all clear signal on contagion too soon, resulting in a second wave of uh, in, in infections. So many political leaders, uh, not just in Washington, but some in, the, in, in, in uh, certain uh, states and, and other countries, other uh, leaders in other countries originally downplayed or ignored or suppressed the information that the virus was coming. I think there's a virus towards public optimism Done a, it's done a lot of harm already in delaying action, and the same kind of bias towards public optimism could lead to a premature reopening. So the precedent I want to mention here is uh, 1918 to 1919 uh, global flu pa pandemic, sometimes called the Spanish flu, but it should not be called that. Um, the first wave was in the spring of 1918. Um, and there have been uh, there's a study of looking at uh, how different cities treated uh, in terms of public health measures and uh, how well they did. And it's, it's pretty uh, suggestive. I'm just going to pick one example. My original hometown is San Francisco. And uh, San Francisco got hit, hit pretty badly in 1918. And then they thought it had passed. Uh, and in November, they declared victory. They went out in the streets. I mean, uh, that was also Armistice Day, November 11th. I think some of that was going out in the streets to celebrate the end of World War I. And uh, they, uh, the, the, the flu came right back again and they were, they were hit uh, in, the, in, the, in the third wave uh, pretty, pretty badly. So I worry about a repeat of that. Mm -hmm. So mistake number one is sounding the all clear signal too soon on, on contagion on the, on the health side. Mistake number two is uh, abandoning the stimulus uh, too soon, resulting in a renewed economic downturn. So the precedent I want to mention here is 1936 and 1937, where uh, uh, Roosevelt's Treasury prematurely uh, curbed spending and raised taxes to return to a balanced budget. Hard to imagine that the that the you know liberal Keynesian Roosevelt wanted to and did balance the budget in the middle of the Great Depression, but that's what. That's what uh, he did. And uh, as Friedman and Schwartz uh, famously uh, pointed out in their, their book, The Monetary History of the US, the Fed tightened in 1936, or at least uh, the, 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 the money supply uh, <clears throat> acted. Uh, 
And so between the, mon the fiscal contraction and the monetary contraction, I think it's pretty clear that that's what caused the recession of 1937 and 38, which was a pretty severe recession, not to mention discouraging, given that uh, after all the, the years of recovery since 1929, that the country had thought it was out of, out of the woods. So um, I, I think that could happen again. And uh, I'll cite a more recent uh, precedent, the recovery from the recession of 2007, 2009, um, in my view, the fiscal stimulus and also what the Fed did uh, in those years uh, played a big role in uh, ending the free fall of the economy, which we were in at the end of 2008, the beginning of 2009, and then uh, starting the recovery in June of 2009. That, uh, that, that, that stimulus, I think, was very effective in heading off the Great Depression and beginning the recovery. But we remember the recovery was very slow. Unemployment was still at uh, above 9% in 2011 and came down very slowly. Why was that? Well, I think one reason is because we prematurely withdrew the fiscal stimulus. Uh, Congress uh, changed hands and uh, Congress uh, blocked uh, further efforts of uh, the, uh, the, the Obama. At that point, you're running out of time here, if we can wrap it up. Okay, I can do it in, in one minute or two. Um, I can do it in one, one more minute. Right, one. one. I can do it in one more minute. Anyway, uh, I, I think that I fear a repeat uh, of a premature withdrawal of stimulus. Uh, it could be coming soon or in 2021. Uh, the way it could happen politically in 2021 is uh, suggested by the, the precedent of, two, of what happened 10 years ago in 2011 when the uh, White House is in the hands of one political party and the Congress is in the hands of the other political party, you can get uh, premature removal of fiscal stimulus. It's, it's very hard to remember the, the virtues of, of counter-cyclical fiscal policy. The one time when it's easy to recognize the virtues of counter-cyclical fiscal policy is if your party is in control of the White House and you're in a recession, then everybody wants to increase spending and cut taxes. Under any other circumstances, it's hard to remember the virtues of that. And I fear uh, we might have a repeat in 2021 uh, where uh, Congress acts uh, prematurely. All of a sudden, they remember the, the dangers of the debt, uh, which somehow the, uh, they uh, forgot in, in 2017, 2018, 2019, when we were at the peak of the business cycle and unconscionably uh, uh, launched the trillion dollar deficits. Uh, but they are dangerous. They remember those dangers when the White House uh, changes, changes hands. And the result is we have premature fiscal con uh, austerity and that we have a W uh, shaped, uh, in other words, we, we have a, a- I think that's a good stopping place there. Maybe a W in the epidemic and a W in the economy. That's my fear. As well. Uh, your interesting, very interesting opening comments made me think of uh, a famous uh, observation by uh, Jack Guttentag and Dick Herring about the uh, what we now call emerging market debt collapse of the 1980s, which is that risks which are very small tend to be treated by the market as if they were zero, not, right. not small risk. Right. And other uh, other comments uh, in in response to Jeff V's use W's or or anything else. Could I just ask, I'm not sure whether this is Jeff or, uh, or, or Tobias, but you made reference to the, to the VIX and the very low level of the VIX, which drives the VAR, which drives the leverage. So we, we've known for almost two decades that this way of measuring risk is profoundly pro-cyclical. Why do we still use it? Well, I think it does capture... Uh, the perceptions of risk, uh, I think it's useful as an indication of whether the markets have a risk on or risk off uh, attitude. When uh, at those times when the risk is low, people go pile into risky assets. They pile into stocks, they pile into junk bonds, they pile into emerging market access, uh, uh, emerging market uh, assets. So it is an accurate measure of the market's perception. It's just not a. Uh, but the uh, point is that it, it generates a form of behavior. That is, count, that is profoundly unhelpful. So do you want to shut down the VIX, shut down the market? I mean, it's accurately capturing an attitude. And I would say it's not the, not the, the, pro, the problem is not in the, uh, the, 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 the VIX. The problem is in the risk on, risk off attitude of the markets, which is accurately measured by the VIX. Thanks, other comments, Tobias? Uh, 
I mean, it's hard to think, uh, uh, to forecast the future. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of the problem. I mean, our own uh, forecast uh, came out on January 20th. And, uh, you know, we are an institution with 1,500 PhD economists, uh, you know, from the best institutions uh, of, of the world. And, uh, you know, we forecasted 3.3% uh, as of January 20th. And that day, uh, you know, markets were starting to sell off in China because of the containment measures. And then it spread around the world. It's just, it's just hard. So I think three things are hard. So we did, so we put out a blog then uh, right around that time. And we said, be aware of stretched asset valuations of high leverage of uh, all, all the pro cyclicality in the system, et cetera. So we warned that, you know, sharp adjustments could happen uh, from a financial stability point of view. But um, it's, so one, I mean, even, even people who are in the business of doing forecasting, it's hard to, to get turning points. It's hard to forecast these humongous events. You saw the virus, everybody, we all read about the virus, uh, but you know, to go from there to saying, oh, it's gonna be like the Spanish flu is, is quite a big step. And it's, it, it's just the world is a complex place. And so unfortunately, forecasting massive downside risk I mean, there's some people that always forecast it, right? And then it doesn't, it's not right. So, and, but to get it right, I mean, to forecast these large downside risks correctly is just extremely hard. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think we can, and, you know, complacency, of course, also plays a role. I, I fully agree with that. I mean, like, as, as the virus spread the world, like every country was like, wow, look at that country and that country. I mean, they must be really screwed up, right? And then it, does, it just goes from country to country to country and then it's like everywhere. And it's like, well, of course they could have anticipated that I would be hit as well, but you know. I think that this time around, you know, we should be able to anticipate a few things, you know, that would indicate that it's very unlikely that you get a V-shape recovery, you know, certainly in the United States. One is there are a whole bunch of external risks, you know, that I'll talk about a little bit in a while about, you know, stuff what, that's going on in Europe, stuff that's going on in the emerging markets. But leaving aside that, just the fact that you've had such an enormous shock to the economy and that you've got a whole bunch of sectors that aren't going to come back and you started from a position where there was credit mispricing I don't think it's too difficult to foresee that we're going to get a whole wave of bankruptcies that are going to cause a lot of financial market risk that'll be uh, make it rather difficult to recover. The second point that I think we should be able to anticipate, and I'm surprised that there's not much more discussion of that, is that we're going to go into a world of deflation. You know, that if I look at the IMF forecast, We've got gaps in labor and product markets that we've never sure. seen before and that are going to persist for many times. So if we go into a world of deflation, then what that means is that because the central banks can't get their interest rates below zero and you've got deflation, you're really taking out monetary policy from the picture. So we really need to have a greater fiscal policy response. You know, and I'm not sure that we're really going to get it. So. I'm not sure, you know, of course, when they lift the restrictions, you'll get a bit of a bounce, but you're not going to get a V because you've really got uh, real problems, real headwinds coming from abroad, coming yeah. from bankruptcies, coming from uh, deflation. So, you know, I think that we're in this uh, uh, world, looks to me like we it, it's stuck there for a while. So let, 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 me, let me just uh, answer that. So when you look back to the financial stability report, for example, of, of October, we say exactly that. We say there are, they are you know, big downside risk because there's a lot of leverage, uh, there's pro-cyclicality in the system, there's risk of fire sales, and all of this, absolutely. So we, you know, we identify. It's just, we always say, you know, there can be a variety of negative shocks. I think what is difficult is to anticipate the negative shock. So we're good at anticipating the amplifiers, the amplification mechanisms that amplify negative shocks downward. And that's exactly what we saw. And this is why the Fed came in massively, it's to arrest the amplifiers. But of course, the size of the shock is still just enormous. Uh, and, and that is what was difficult 
you know, forecasting negative new or forecasting shocks is difficult. Analyzing amplifiers, we can do, and that's exactly what we do when we do financial stability assessments. We look at the amplifiers. We don't try to anticipate the shocks because, you know. There is uh, uh, the question of not only that they are amplified, but how much they are amplified. And I, for me, at least, this a surprising thing was the yeah. the amazing extent of the financial reaction to. Of course, it was a big shock, but yeah. the the reaction of the already fragile system. I want to stick in a question from the audience here because I think it uh, follows very well on what Desmond was saying in particular. And the question is, uh, we know this term uh, SIFI, systemically important financial institutions or, or big banks, big financial institutions. Does anybody on the panel foresee the failure of one or more SIFIs? Uh, and if so, uh, what will the government response be? Anybody? I'm not going to answer that, but I will say that one of the things that I think uh, one of the ways and respects in which we are in stronger shape in terms of financial markets this time than we were in 2008 is the financial reforms that were uh, put in place at Dodd-Frank in the United States and uh, 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 the Financial Stability Board um, uh, and uh, Basel III and all that. Um, and. Uh, they, they, they did involve stress tests and higher capital uh, requirements and all of that. And they were supposed to apply to uh, not just to banks, but to some non-bank financial institutions. I think we're in stronger shape this time because of that, but, uh, but not as much as we could be, particularly with regard to the non-financial institutions. And some of that is because of backtracking uh, that, was, uh, that was done uh, over the last uh, a few years, undermining Dodd-Frank. Um, uh, and just one example of that would be uh, uh, failure to classify any non-financial uh, institutions as uh, non-bank financial institutions, rather, as, uh, as SIFIs. And so okay, therefore- we are, uh, we are out of time for this question, but I'll take one more comment on anybody who thinks we'll see a failure of a SIFI well, in, in the subsequent rapid bailout. You'd be surprised if you didn't see a failure. You've seen many failures because what you're doing is you're seeing so many different asset classes being so beat up. You're seeing it across countries uh, that there's bound to have been a lot of leverage, you know, that it'll be the Warren Buffett kind of idea that when the tide is out, we'll see who was swimming naked, you know, that you can't uh, figure it out. But just the fact that you had so much debt, so much debt mispriced, and now you've got a major league shock to the system mm -hmm that is going to cause the bankruptcies. It has to cause a huge amount of mispricing and people are going to get caught on the wrong side of the trade. You know, I'd be really surprised if we don't see an LTCM or two. Thanks, Desmond. All right, let us go on to question three. This is going to be Bill. Uh, before the coronavirus shock, global debt levels were already higher than on the eve of the 2008 Great Recession. What's likely to happen to this debt now, which is clearly rising again, and what should be done to address the global debt problem, Bill? Well, just to, to go back on some of those numbers, uh, I was just looking at the um, Institute for International Finance's numbers, and what they would contend is that the global debt level, which is 280% of GDP in 2008, uh, has gone up to 320% by the end of 2019. And the projection on the basis of, I guess, their projection on the basis of the IMF's projection of mm -hmm. um, GDP falling 3% in 2020 is we'll go to 340% of global GDP. So this is just a, an extraordinary uh, increase prior to the crisis and now another extraordinary increase projected for the, end, uh, for the first year of the crisis. One of the things, this goes back to the comment that I guess uh, Desmond made about uh, Warren Buffett. You, you only see who's naked when the tide goes out. We shouldn't um, give too much emphasis to these numbers as such. Uh, when you start thinking about things, for example, like government debt, and you say, oh, it's very high. Uh, if you look at some of the numbers that take account of the off balance sheet stuff, which is, you know, like Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, you get to numbers that are three or four hundred times, um, hundred percent higher uh, 
than those, those on balance sheet numbers. Um, and there are all sorts of other ways too in which I think we're actually underestimating the extent to which there are problems out there. Now, I, I just want to make the sort of the general point that I think as we, we headed into the, sorry, prior to this pandemic, my sense of it was that the global economy was basically an accident waiting to happen. And it could have become, it could have come about because of a kind of endogenous uh, break, something went wrong. Uh, it could have happened because of an exogenous shock, as it turned out it was an exogenous shock. But I think it was an accident waiting to happen. And the basic reason for that, in my judgment, is that monetary policy has been used as basically the only way to maintain stimulus in the economy and to continue the growth. And the problem with doing that is that there's a fundamental intertemporal inconsistency in the repeated use of monetary policy. Because every time you do it, and we've been doing it now for three decades, really since 1987, every time you do it, you build up debt levels. And the debt levels, as Alan Greenspan reminded us, are just headwinds against which you have to push the next time that you want to do monetary expansion. And the logic of that tells you that eventually you get to a point where it doesn't work at all. And I think that's pretty well on where we've gotten to with respect to monetary policy. Um, the other thing that we can forget is that there are all sorts of other, what I used to call it the BIS imbalances uh, in the economy that are generated by this ultra easy monetary policy. And one of them, of course, is on the financial side. And we've been worried for ages and ages about the stability of many of our financial institutions. And I know Tobias said, well, you know, prior to the crisis, the banks look, looked fine. But there were more and more people, particularly in Europe, who were pointing out the fact that the fundamental business model of the banks, you know, of intermediation and, and profiting from the spread, uh, was really becoming less and less viable. And when you look at the insurance companies and the pension fund, it's exactly the same kind of thing. These guys have got very long liabilities and the lower are the interest rates and the discount rate for the liabilities, the more they tend to be underwater. And when you add in the fact that you've got all these big problems in terms of low interest rates, the search for yield, people doing things that 20 years ago would have been considered to be totally silly, uh, we, we have a, a big problem. Well, then the next question becomes, okay, we've got a big problem. What are, what are we going to do, do about it? These debt levels are, are, are going way up. And I suspect what will happen is that the, the, the fiscal and the monetary authorities, Jeff, I, I, this is a different view from the one you expressed. I, I think they will just simply double down on both monetary expansion and fiscal expansion. And on the one hand, it might work. I mean, you can envisage a world in which we get out of this debt problem the same way as we did at the end of World War II, which is you, you basically generate some growth, you generate some inflation, and you keep the interests repressed or very, very low in order that the, the, the debt burden, the economy is growing faster than the debt is, is growing, and so the debt burden goes down. You can imagine that happening. And I think imagining that happening will be the motivation for the, for the authorities to do what they do. But there is, of course, another downside to it, and that is that um, maybe that whole process, if it does start, gets totally out of control. And that's a world in which you're heading into very high inflation, hyperinflation. We've seen this many, many times before in Latin America and in many other places. So you can't just rule it out. So we might get out of this thing through stimulative monetary and fiscal policies, but there are risks. I think what we need to do is we spend, we need to spend a lot more time thinking about Debt is the problem, and we have to address it straight on, look it in the eyes, and do a lot more in terms of restructuring than we're currently talking about. So I was looking, for example, at the, at the, at the wheel, and I think they've got a paragraph in there about this is something that people should be thinking about. I think we should really be taking steps to try to improve the way in which we do debt restructuring. 
there have been all sorts of reports recently, the WP1 at the OECD, the IMF itself, the G30, all sorts of reports about the difficulties that we will have in terms of dealing with debt and why we should do something about it. So when you look at sort of corporate debt, for example, uh, we, we, we know that um, the, the numbers corporate debt are very, very high. We know that the procedures for dealing with them are, are not adequate. When we look at the, the financial institutions, it's exactly the same thing. And the, the bigger the institutions become, the harder it's going to be to try to resolve them. You know, there's some that are not just too big to fail, they're too big to save. Um, so we've got, and they're too big to save because, um, because we can't restructure, we can't restructure them doing so much collateral damage, we can't contemplate doing it. But the worst of all is the sovereign debt. And you're starting to see this already with Argentina and with uh, the, 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 the pushback on the IMF suggestion or the G20 suggestion that the private sector creditors should back off the, the demand for interest payments. Um, when you look at public sector debt, we have no criteria that's agreed for when people should go into default or restructure. Okay? There's no agreed criteria for when that should happen. There is nothing to prevent people uh, from actually making more loans that makes the underlying debt problem worse, which is exactly what the Europeans did in the Greek crisis and, and, and subsequently. So there are all sorts of things that we should be addressing having to do with administrative and judicial shortcomings with respect to the restructuring process. And I guess my contention would be we're, we're, we're not paying anywhere near as much attention to this fundamental problem of debt and what to do about it. Uh, not anywhere near as much attention as I think we should be paying to it. Thank you, Bill. Uh, responses, comments, Tobias? Yeah, I'm, so let me, let me say a couple of things. So uh, I fully agree that uh, debt uh, has been rising in many sectors. Uh, fortunately, in the banking sector, debt has been, has been uh, declining. So there's leverage has been going down in, in the banks. And so we're in a better shape now. But of course, the shock is so severe that uh, it is, it is of, of the order of magnitude or sometimes even larger than what uh, the adverse scenarios of stress tests assume. So this is for the banks. Now, in the market-based system, there have been efforts to contain leverage, uh, but I fully agree that certainly more can be done in market-based finance to contain leverage. I think, you know, there's, there's some uh, constraints, but uh, more of a market potential approach in market-based finance or shadow banking is certainly on the agenda uh, um, uh, further down the road. Now, concerning sovereign debt, I mean, the fund uh, has uh, had over 100 countries come uh, with financing uh, requests, what, over 100 countries, right? We have a membership of 190 countries, more than half have come to us with requests for financing. Now, most of these are rapid financing uh, requests. So they, these, are, these are fairly small loans, a couple of billion or so, um, that uh, come without conditionality. But of course, once we go into a real program, there's mm -hmm. conditionality and conditionality means debt sustainability. I mean, that is the foundation for fund programs. And that is one way in which at least those countries that come to the fund do have a severe constraint on leverage. Um, of course, constraining leverage of sovereigns more generally outside of, of programs is a pretty tall order. and. Uh, in particular, in, in a world where interest rates are very low and I expect it to stay very low for a very long time. And you know, monetary policy is, is one side of the story, but of course the other side of the story is, is the agent of the society, is the slowdown in productivity and the demand for safe assets. All of these you know, put downward pressures on interest rates, the natural rate of interest, the R star that is often discussed, which, which is not related to monetary policy. And when rates are so low, well, you know, incentives to take on debt are high. Mm. Well, I'm not. I'm not so sure that the rates are are, are low, um, because of. Uh, I think rates are. The, the the reason one of the reasons why the rate of growth of productivity has been so low, uh, 
is because low interest rates have allowed banks and others to basically evergreen loans. We've seen a massive increase in the number of zombie companies that are low productivity growth companies, which keep resources away from the companies that might be highly productive companies. So there, there is in fact a real implication of these monetary, mm -hmm. monetary policy shocks. I mean, I think that uh, there has been reaching for yield, as you pointed out, there has been reaching of yield for yield, you know, for many years. Uh, so, you know, getting funding for new projects has been fairly, fairly easy. Let's see if uh, Desmond or Jeffrey comments uh, further on this debt issue. Well, I had a question for, for, for Bill um, on the subject of monetary policy. And I want to say that I, I feel like I learned from Bill White uh, years ago, the proposition that, that our models, Phillips curve and all that, 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 that say that the way you tell when monetary policy is too easy is goods market inflation. I feel like I learned from Bill years ago that sometimes it doesn't show up in goods market inflation, but rather in, in asset price inflation. True about the Japanese bubble of the late the 80s and uh, true of the, uh, uh, the, the leading up to the global financial crisis. Um, uh, neither of which was accompanied by uh, particularly goods market inflation, but asset market inflation have both resulted in crashes. So my question, Bill, is uh, the, the Fed has received a fair amount of criticism in 2018 for raising interest rates three times, and then they reversed them and cut, cut, cut the interest rates in 2019. Is your critique just that chronically interest rates have been too low for decades, or would you specifically say that the Fed uh, was right to raise interest rates three times and should have done it more in 2018, and that it was a mistake to cut interest rates in 2019. Well, I I, th I think my general my general premise is I think monetary policy has actually been too easy for a very long period of time, and I would start off by saying again, real financial interlinkages is that we had all of this globalization, we had the positive supply shock of the baby boomers. You know, we've had 20 years of declining inflation that was basically due to positive supply side shocks. And for monetary policy to respond to that by saying, uh, we have to pull out all the stops in order to increase demand, uh, just struck me as totally ignoring all of the stuff that's not in the standard models, which is by that ultra easy monetary policy and by all of that easing you're creating all of these other problems, particularly in the financial sector, but also, as I just said, problems in the real sector too. Misallocations of real resources, concerns about which of course have gone back to Hayek and Minsky and, and all these folk. It's not like any of this stuff is new. They talked about- At this cycle. point, uh, stick in a question from the audience, which is very relevant, which is uh, thinking about the debt and all of the uh, points just made. Uh, how much more treasury debt can the Fed, Federal Reserve absorb, or let's state it generally, how much more sovereign debt can central banks absorb? Uh, is there some limit, and are, if so, are we, uh, are we approaching it, or how might that end? So, uh, you know, it, it, it matters to think about inflation, right? So, uh, at the moment, inflation expectations are, are well contained. If anything, inflation is, is running below target. And so that generally tells you that there's space there. And uh, I mean, you have seen what's happened in Japan where inflation has run below target for many years. And, uh, you know, even uh, very large amounts of asset purchases and yield curve control has not uh, managed to bring uh, inflation back to target. So, so, I don't think, so I think you have to think about that in the context of inflation, inflation expectations, uh, anchoring and 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 you know yeah. how much room there is and some countries have room because we are in a in a, in a sharply deflationary environment yeah. i I, I would agree with that I think we have more we have more room on the fiscal side my my only point would be and it's it all also a point made in the the wheel and in your your global financial stability report Tobias is that the markets have patience but so we should already be sort of thinking about the further future. And the problem in the past, honestly, it's, it's always in the upturns. The problem is not in the downturn. The problem is in the upturn that the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities never tighten symmetrically 
to offset all the easing they did in the downturns. Well, the exception would be the late 90s. Sorry? The exception is the second half of the 90s, which was a strong, uh, at that point, record expansion. And the, the, the government did take the measures to uh, rein in spending and- uh, that, and was, that was one example months. amongst many, many, Jeff, right? Um, generally example. speaking, the debt levels everywhere have just ratcheted up cycle after cycle. And the interest rates, both nominal and real, have ratcheted down cycle after cycle. Yeah. And I guess my point, to finish with this, is that we have been on a bad path. And we also start, we need to start thinking very seriously about how we get onto a different kind of path that's going to be more sustainable and more resilient. We have uh, one audience question, Bill, for you uh, on, on that. And the question is on fiscal policy. Uh, shouldn't government start, especially in this country, uh, taking away the tax incentives for debt uh, and for the increase in debt? Would corporate that debt. logical policy response. This is cer this certainly would be something that I would recommend in an in a new system in an altered system, but moving to do something like that at this juncture. You know, in the middle of in the middle of this pandemic, uh, strikes me as being a bit uh, cavalier. Yes, I think this would be for after the second uh, uh, yeah. rise in the W. Yeah, this is, this is definitely, definitely for the future. In December two thousand seventeen, uh, corporate income tax rate was cut, which I think it needed to be cut. But uh, should it not have been done in a revenue revenue neutral way? And the obvious way to get the, raise the box would be to. Uh, curtailed the tax deductibility of uh, interest for corporations, which would have helped make it revenue neutral uh, and, and eliminate this pro-cyclical expansion of the deficit at the peak of the business cycle. And at the same time would have provided an incentive to corporations to finance themselves less with debt. Yeah. And more with equity. More with equity. Other comments on the debt problem? So I, I fully agree that uh, that you have to uh, think uh, about macroprudential policy more broadly. Uh, I think that that is one framework to to address this this question. Uh, we have been successful in containing leverage in the banking sector. Uh, that might have to be applied to to many other sectors as well. All right. Let's uh, at that with that go on to question four, and Desmond, and to remind us the question. In, uh, in its complete form is, the coronavirus crisis has had a particularly severe economic impact on Europe and on the emerging market countries. How likely is it that this will trigger another round of European sovereign debt crisis or Euro survival crisis uh, and or another wage of emerging market debt defaults? And this is yours, Desmond. Thank you. Uh Alex, as I've already mentioned, the risks, you know, certainly to the United States economy, that they're very real external risks that stand a very good chance of getting triggered. And basically the problem stems from the fact that we went into this crisis, you know, with many places over in debt that they hadn't really addressed their debt problems. And now they get hit by a big shock. So my concern of the kind of external risks that we could be seeing pretty near term, uh, we could be seeing one is we could be seeing Europe headed for another round of its Euro's, uh, sovereign, European sovereign debt crisis. You know, I think that that is very likely. Another is uh, that we could see China moving to a very much slower growth path than it had before. And the third uh, risk that uh, I think is very likely is you're going to see a wave of emerging market debt defaults, you know, both sovereign and corporate. And you could see that in middle side income countries, you know, places like Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, uh, that, you know, could have a, uh, a, a systemic impact, you know, particularly in this uh, troubled time that we're living at. So let me just elaborate on each of those points, you know, why I think we could be going for a, another round of the sovereign debt crisis. You know, I think that that's easiest if you just look at Italy, uh, you know, which uh, to remind everybody, Italy is 10 times the size of Greece. So if you get a crisis in Italy, uh, 
Uh, it's going to be like Greece on steroids, you know, going back a uh, few years. The reason why you worry about Italy is that the coronavirus has been the epicenter of the European coronavirus epidemic that the IMF is now thinking that GDP there could decline by nine and a half percent. I mean, this is massive. And what they did is they went into this crisis with a public debt ratio that was already at 135 percent, too high a level of public debt and a weak banking system. So you take this just arithmetically, this moves their debt to levels like 150, 160 percent of GDP. It opens up their budget deficit to eight and a half percent of GDP. And then it, with the banking system, you've got a weak banking system that you now have a deep recession. What do you think is going to happen to all of the uh, household debt and the corporate debt? The banks are going to just be loaded with non-performing loans. They've already got far too much public Italian bonds on their balance sheet. So we're going to get a nice banking crisis in Italy. It's difficult to see how you uh, escape that. Now, stuck in the euro, the last time around, Italy wasn't able to grow. There's no reason to think that they're going to be able to grow this time around. They don't have their own monetary policy. They don't have an exchange rate policy. They don't have much fiscal space. So if they stay stuck there, with a, they can't get their debt level down. This means that they're on an unsustainable path. So what we're going to see pretty soon, in my view, is we're, going to, we're already seeing it, that the markets are challenging the central bank. We've seen spreads on Italian debt in relation to Germany. They're now something like 260 points. They're testing whether Europe has got the political willingness to come and bail out Italy. Bailing out Italy is going to be very difficult because it's very costly. So we're talking just the public sector. You know, if you just say that they've got to buy the maturing debt and finance the deficit, that's one trillion. You, you might need another 500 billion for the banks. It's a question whether the Northern European countries are going to be wanting to keep Italy afloat, not to mention the political problems that Italy's got. Salvini is waiting there in the wings. He doesn't like the euro. Europe is losing popularity. So that's the European uh, sovereign uh, debt crisis that I think is just an accident waiting to happen. Just a word on China. Uh, China's got hit hard by the coronavirus, but the point that doesn't get enough attention is that before the coronavirus hit China, China was experiencing an epic, uh, a, a credit bubble of epic proportions. We've never seen credit increase by 100% of GDP to the non-government sector that quickly. So they had their credit bubble, they had bubbles in asset prices, uh, housing markets, commercial real estate, there was a lot of excess capacity. So if you now get the shock you could expect that that is going to cause a lot of bankruptcies in China. The banks are going to be loaded with stuff. And what you're also going to see is you're going to see foreign companies a lot less willing to invest in China. They won't want their supply chains. They don't, won't want to be exposed again. So long story short is China could very well go the way that Japan went, very high rates of growth followed by prolonged period of very mediocre growth. And in China, that's important because being the second largest economy in the world, the main driver of the main engine of economic growth, the main consumer of international commodities, that's a global event. That brings me to the third uh, area of external concern is the, uh, is the, um, the emerging market economies. Now, what's happened in the emerging market economies is that their debt levels approximately doubled over the last 10 years. So we're now talking about emerging markets have got $70 trillion of debt. You know, there's obviously far too much debt. The money was too easy. It went to these places that shouldn't have been borrowing on this scale. And now they're being hit by a perfect storm. You know, So they're getting hit now by the coronavirus. It's now going into South America. The Southern hemisphere is uh, getting that. So they've got that shock with all of this debt. And on top of that, they've got the, because China is slowing and the world economy is slowing, international commodity prices are collapsing. That's not too good for them. And then what we've just seen is the last month, uh, we've seen capital repatriation money being 
drawn out of these emerging markets at a rate that we haven't seen before. So, you know, this is just a question of time before you get big countries. You know, of course, the small countries uh, that shouldn't have been in the market at all, those uh, will all default, but you know, you could get problems in a country like Brazil, a country like Turkey, a country like South Africa, all of those have got really very poor public finances. Now they're getting hit by a shock. So all of this means that we've got three real shocks that have got a very high chance of uh, materializing. You know, and for that reason, uh, I think that this can have global financial market implications that the United States should really be mindful that in the same way as in 2008, a bankruptcy at a small investment bank called Lehman caused a global financial crisis, you know, caused spillover to the rest of the world. What we could see is now something working in reverse, problems in Europe, problems in the emerging markets spilling back to the United States financial markets and on the United States economy. So I thought I wanted to end this on a cheerful note, and there we are. Thank you, Desmond. Okay, well, Italy, uh, China, uh, epic bubble, uh, emerging market debt defaults, possible impact on the U.S. Who would like to take up any of these points with other comments? You know, so the, the IMF has about a trillion dollars of balance sheet capacity to help countries uh, that cannot borrow in markets anymore. And, uh, you know, as I said, we have had 100, over 100 uh, requests for financing already. So we are ready to help our membership and, um, uh, you know, uh, any, any countries that need assistance. Of course, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the fund can only lend when that is sustainable. So, um, you know, that means that uh, um, uh, that uh, is, is at the center of, 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 any, of any fund program. Bill, so it's, it's very seems, well, in, yeah, very much aligned with your concerns, yes. Excuse me. Uh, Bill, it certainly seems that Desmond's comments uh, fit into your request for better ways to deal with, with uh, defaults and restructurings, that is to say, with making debt go away. Uh, especially for sovereigns, but for private as private uh, entities as well. Do you have any other comments on that? Well, I think one of the one of the the, the, the problems is that in in fact in the emerging markets, it's it seems to me that the situation over the course of the last number of years has become even more dangerous than it was before. And uh, one of the reasons is in the old days, I guess the emerging markets borrowed largely from not solely, but the the much greater preponderance of borrowing from public sector creditors who gave subsidized interest rates. But now, of course, m much of the borrowing is private sector sources w without subsidy. And in addition, you've got China. Nobody really has got a very clear picture of how big those Chinese debts are or how the Chinese will react when they're asked to sort of back off in terms of the demanding the interest payment. So that's, that's a problem. Um, the other one, I guess, is that um, we see this in Argentina, that all this business about, so if you're bo borrowing on the private sector side and particularly in bond markets, then the question becomes, what are the procedures for dealing with um, debt reduction through the bond market? And that's where you need these collective action clauses. But, you know, we've been talking about trying to do something about that since 1994. And basically, all of those old bonds are still out there without those contracts. And so all you need is a relatively small number of people to say, we don't want to play, and nothing happens. So that's another problem. And the last thing, and I'm sure Tobias knows more about this than I do, but I was thinking back to this business about the New York court ruling. You remember in this, this MNL capital versus uh, Argentina? Yeah. All I can remember from that was the, the line that somebody used was, it throws restructuring into limbo, <laughs> in legal terms. Where, where, where does all, anyway, the, the bottom line is, it seems to me that, that it may be even more difficult to resolve these problems going forward than it was in, in previous years. <laughs>
All right, I have a question from the audience. Uh, Desmond, I think this is directed uh, especially to you. Uh, it says, Italy just announced an additional 55 billion euro stimulus package or 3% of GDP. But if they can continue to borrow at 1.5%, that's a little interest uh, relative to uh, GDP. So, so why worry? Hmm. What me worry? Well, what 3% uh, of GDP, you know, that's great, you know, in terms of trying to stimulate the economy, but I think one needs to see it in context, you know, that if you look at the kind of stimulus package that you've seen in the United States, that's been $2 trillion, that's around about 10% of the United States GDP. So something like a 3% of GDP on top of the 2% that they've already done that's half the amount that you're getting elsewhere. Italy, one of its weaknesses in this kind of crisis is that their tourist sector is something like 7% of GDP. There's no way that tourist sector is going to come back this year. So they're getting that shock on top of a coronavirus shock. You know, so the depth is huge. Now, in terms of borrowing, uh, markets have been lending the... Uh, Italians money, you know, on the assumption that the ECB was going to buy all of their bonds, you know, as soon as that turns out not to be a, a sure bet, you get the spread widening. So what we're already seeing is Italian interest rates are already at 2%. And I would say that even with low interest rates, uh, the debt of it Italy is on a unsustainable path, because the depth of the recession what that has done is it's creating a huge budget deficit. So you look at the IMF estimates, the IMF is saying that the budget deficit in Italy is going to be 8.5% of GDP. So minimally, it's 8.5% of GDP. Even if interest rates are zero, an 8.5% of GDP budget deficit means that Italy's got a big primary budget deficit now. So debt is uh, on a totally unsustainable path. They've got to bail out the banks. It really does not look pretty good. Thank you, Desmond. Other other comments on, on this issue? Well, I, I had a, a question that was inspired by what Tobias said uh, about the IMF has got the resources to lend to uh, emerging market countries or other countries in, 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 in trouble. But there is this, uh, this constraint that you have you can only lend to a country that has a sustainable ratio of debt to GDP. Um, what, what is your view, if you're allowed to, to uh, state one, uh, of uh, the proposal that the IMF issue a new round of SDRs? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, so, so we are taking many initiatives at the moment in order to be more agile, uh, more nimble, and have new ways of lending. Whether a trillion is enough or not remains to be seen. Uh, you know, it might be that at some point we do need more. Uh, an SDR allocation, you know, primarily goes to advanced economies, right? Because um, the IMF works a little bit like a, like a mutual uh, and everybody pays in. And uh, of course the richest countries pay in most. So then the, the idea that some are floating is that these SDRs are given uh, by uh, the advanced economies to emerging markets. Uh, so like lend to emerging markets under the under the uh, oversight of the IMF, of course. And, you know, the whole system works because we have conditionality, because everybody pays money in and they make sure, I mean, I have a board and the board is overseeing me and they uh, make sure that we're not lending into unsustainable situations. Um, and so, you know, this is why debt sustainability is at the heart of, of everything the fund is doing. Um, so, um, Tobias, you know, can I ask yes. you, I mean, you, 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 you're sort of implying that the fund won't lend to a country unless that country has taken steps to make its debt sustainable. Exactly. The, 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 the sticking point is if the money is owed to the private sector that refuses to do a voluntary deal, are we then in a situation where not only is there a no voluntary deal, but there's also no lending from the fund because they haven't met the debt sustainability requirement? Yes, all right, private sector involvement. 
you can see the kind of questions that uh, <laughs> it's crossing our minds these days. So, you know, there's a reason why the why the Paris Club was created. There's a reason why the UN, I think, yesterday uh, called for um, you know some uh, new forms of debt restructuring. Of course, we are heavily engaged with uh, all parties. And uh, these are very, very challenging uh, problems. Uh, you know, the courts, the legal systems involved, there's a diversity of, 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 of characters involved. It is, it, is, it is very challenging and uh, we're there to help our membership, but um, none of these things are straightforward. Let me put it that way. And, I, yeah. I changed the question just one little bit. We've been talking right. about solvency, and I think that's absolutely central. Okay, that's been right. the essence of my right. presentation. But let's let's talk liquidity as well. Um, these numbers from the IIF indicate that for indicate the debt of emerging market countries denominated in foreign currency now right. amounts to $5.3 trillion. Right. Um, I've been pleased that the Fed took the steps that it did take to extend the swap agreements. Yeah. But this really doesn't apply to everybody. Um, what's, your, what's your assessment of how adequate the liquidity yeah, so how, we, how that will be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. So the fund has been pushing for multilateral type of swap lines for many, many years. And uh, last week in the spring meetings, we did, uh, we did uh, a, a proposal for additional uh, liquidity lines was actually uh, accepted. That's not going to help every country in the world. It's going to help countries that are in pretty good shape. So. Now, having said that, the Fed also put out a new repo facility where any uh, institution that holds treasuries with the New York Fed can repo them against cash. The list of countries that are eligible is not public, but it's a very large number of countries. Of course, it's collateralized because the problem, you know, the, the reason that the Fed can only give that many is that, of course, the Fed has a mandate to protect the taxpayer, so it's not allowed to take on credit. So that's the, that's the crux of the problem. Um, at, that, uh, at that point, we were getting close to being out of time. And that's a, with these conundrums, that may be a good place to uh, stop and, and keep thinking. But we do have about two minutes left. I'd like to give Desmond, who is the founder of this conference and whose superb sense of timing scheduled it for mid-March uh, originally, uh, the chance to have the last word. Desmond, on, this, on the whole... Uh, on our whole discussion, putting everything together uh, on uh, all of the questions, the, the crisis, well, uh, the outlook, the debt problem, and, and, and the fact that it's around the world. Uh, can, what, what concluding comments would you have? Well, the concluding comment I have is to thank the panelists for their participation, but not to thank them for making me any more optimistic than I was at the beginning of this panel. So they've just given me more reason to be concerned, you know, how difficult a situation uh, in which uh, we face ourselves. You know, I just think that if you are looking for reasons for optimism, it has been the unusually bold policy response. You know, we've never seen anything like this you know, done in the space of a couple of months, you know, both on the fiscal and the monetary policy side. I just make one point that I was wanting to make earlier, uh, that I think that the mistake hasn't been in the past that we've had interest rates too low. The mistake has been that we've put too much of a burden on the central banks. That is the reason that they had to keep interest rates low, that we should have had a better balance between monetary and fiscal policy. More fiscal policy would have helped us you're not set us up for the next crisis by creating all of the mm. uh, credit mispricing and too much debt. But you know that is water under the bridge. Thank you, Desmond, and thanks again uh, to all our colleagues on the panel, and thank you to all of you in the audience for participating with us today. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Buddy, be healthy. Thank you.